there is a discrepancy between what we say we want to do before we die and what dying say they wish they would have done while they actually lived. What, what do you do if you knew you were going to die? I know it's a great way to start this whole series out. But what are the experiences that you would want to have? The conversations that you need to make sure that happen? Uh, the unfinished business that you'd want to complete? A hospice nurse named Brownie Ware wrote a book called The Five Regrets of Dying. We're actually using this book for this series. She was working with people who had essentially gone home to die, people who had anywhere from three to 12 weeks left to live. And she discovered what a special, precious time it was to spend these last weeks with somebody. But she also discovered something else, that when people are faced with their own mortality, that there's this significant capacity for personal growth. And that as people were faced with their last weeks of their lives, there was a clarity about their lives that they wouldn't have had if they weren't facing their own mortality. As people headed into the last weeks of their lives and processed the, the way they had lived, she noticed certain themes that came up over and over again. And what's fascinating is that their regrets are not the things that we typically find in mo most people's bucket lists. An entire industry has actually sprung up in recent years, I don't know if you've known this, around helping people achieve their bucket list items. If you go to places like bucketlist.org or bucketlist.net, you'll find like online social networks arranged around actually helping you discover and then live out your bucket list. How many of you have a bucket list? Or that's just been a theme of friends and conversation. Some of the bucket list items that tend to show up for different people are things like visiting an island somewhere in some like desolute place, go parasailing, climbing up a volcano, learning new things like archery or buying a, a beach house or eating five pounds of bacon in one day. I don't know what it is for you, but what's fascinating is that if you take the things that most people put on their bucket list and you can pair those with the last weeks of their lives, and what they would say that they wish they would have done, you would find this huge, significant discrepancy. The things that many of us are pursuing to do before we die may, in fact, actually leave us with regrets when we get to the end of our lives. What we have placed on our own bucket list are not the same things that those who have clarity as they near their own death say that they wish they would have accomplished. What if we, what if we could learn from the dying about how to actually live? What if, what if in those last weeks of their lives, they could provide us with such clarity that if we were to actually pay attention, we would get to the end with no regrets? And what if they reveal to us what the real bucket list actually is? So we're gonna spend the next five weeks talking about the real bucket list, five regrets that we can learn. The first regret of dying is having the courage to live a life true to myself, rather than the life others expected of me. You agree with that? The first regret that Bonnie Ware, that hospice nurse heard over and over again people say was, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. What people said at the end of their life is reminiscent of what the author Stephen Pressfield wrote. Most of us have two lives, the life we live and the unlived life within us. This is from the book War of Art. We see in uh, 1 Samuel 17, 38 through 40, this is an infamous story about David and Goliath when David was getting ready to go and take and conquer Goliath. See, when David was a young shepherd, he had an experience where he has the expectations of others thrust upon him, how others would handle this specific situation. And Saul actually tried to dress David in his own armor. It's how Saul knew how to fight in his own armor. If Saul was going into this battle against Goliath, this is the armor that he would have worn, and this is how he would have fought. And so his assumption is that that that's how David would also need to fight, that it would work for David as well. And he was trying to wear someone else's armor. And David said, I can't wear that because I'm not used to it. It's not my armor. 
How often do you find yourself living your life trying to wear, friends, someone else's armor? You're a mom and you read on mom blogs how other moms are managing work and kids field trips and being on PTA and homeschooling, all of the above, and you feel this pressure to try to do what they do. But you're trying to wear someone else's armor. You know someone who learns by reading a ton, but you learn by talking things out and visually with people. And they read like 50 books a year and you think you should do that too. Someone always has new ideas. But that's not how you think. That's not how you operate. Someone who is more sociable than you, you're just more reserved. Someone who weighs the options rather than being quick to act. Someone who goes with the flow, but you tend to be more opinionated. You can think you're supposed to be something else. And whenever we get caught up in all of that, or we find ourselves in that place like David, we have to be able to say, I'm not used to this. This isn't who I am. This isn't my armor. The author Paul wrote in Galatians 1.10, he said, am I trying to win the approval of human beings or God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. As Paul in this circumstance is faced with opposition, he has to decide at this moment whether he will simply do and say the things that keep him in favor with others. You've been there? It would be easy for him to give in to the gospel that others had began to preach and the way that they want him now to preach it. The freedom from that isn't found simply in trying to do something different than everyone's expectations. Like uh, a rebellious teenager who is rebellious simply just because it's different from their parents' expectations. The freedom is instead found in linking himself to Christ. He says that he is a servant of Christ. Some translations, as you can see on the screen right now, actually translate to a slave of Christ. It's a way actually of saying that his life had become intimately bound up in Christ and cannot be separated from it. It is dependent on Christ. And it's where for Paul, he begins to discover actually his true self when he binds up his life in Christ. Living true to yourself requires a change of focus. Rather than looking around me, I instead rest in knowing, pleasing, pursuing God, which results in being able to live more fully and truthfully than when I compare myself to others. But there's something hard about all of this, right? As you can see right now, we're actually at a stadium, a football stadium. And what happens at a stadium is you can find yourself in the center and on the field here and you can be participating in a play and, and then there's touchdowns and what do you have behind me? You have stands and people. And what are you working for? The applause of other people. Applause is a dangerous thing, isn't it? I know that uh, I recently have had some intimate interactions and opportunities to make decisions, am I going to actually bow down and continue to look for the applause and making everyone happy, being someone that someone else wants me to be, or actually focusing and being who God created me to be and using my gifts that he has given to me for him. I'm not looking for empathy here, but I figured I would give a personal example. Just this week, in fact, I thought it was really beautiful because the timing was gracious, I think, of God in this, and that's the way I'm looking at it. Is As many of you know who participate at Northgate, uh, recently we've been really trying to send out all church emails to let people know what's going on and what's coming up and how people can participate. And it's actually from me, my email. <laughs> And so people sometimes respond to those emails. Well, this week I woke to a response to one of these all church emails and it simply stated this. I left this church two years ago because I cannot stand Larry. Then it said downgrade exclamation mark. Please remove me from this list. Now I had a choice friends right then. 
Was I going to ruminate on this all day? Was I going to start to look for the applause of this person and say, what am I missing? What is it that they need me to do that I'm not doing? And how do I upgrade the things that I'm doing? And, and, and can I get the applause from everyone? Can I make everyone happy? Or do I need to sit here and say, I am who I am. God made me as who I am. Not to please other people, because if I just become a people pleaser, I'm unable to please him at times. It just becomes this thing where I'm seeking after the approval of others in career, in love, in position, in money, in things. This relentless, non-ending pursuit. I tell you that again, not because I need you all to send me an email that says, I love you and you're good. I give you that example because it's real life. Because you experience that real life. Some things that are actually said to you like that and some things that are unspoken that you know are being said about you. Applause can be such a dangerous thing. We all crave applause, don't we? We crave to be known by the crowd by the level of influence in our community, position at work, number of likes on Facebook or friends, number of followers on Twitter or how many views my TikTok video has gotten, you fill in the blank. We actually convince ourselves that one of these proofs of being known will satisfy us, but they don't. Have you ever paused and thought about how easy it is for us to live for the applause of others rather than the approval of God? It's a subtle shift that happens in our life that we don't really get to recognize until we begin altering our values. These, these values were once driven by a desire to please God, but slowly drift in pressing others, convincing others of how great we are, trying to prove to others how worthy we are. We give God glory simply by being ourselves. We give God glory by simply being ourselves. This is said by Brennan Manning in his book, Abba's Child. For many, we can have a regret at the end of our life. Most of our lives can feel like me was never good enough. Here's some of the examples of how I usually can see that this plays out. I can sit here and say, I wasn't good enough for my teachers. I wasn't good enough for my friends. I wasn't good enough for my mom and my dad. I wasn't good enough for my coach. I wasn't good enough for my kids. I wasn't good enough for my job. The list goes on and on and on. And you can buy into this lie of the enemy so deeply that it begins to grip your heart like a python. You find yourself walking through this dark and desperate place of living our lives in our own way, only to find ourselves in a condition of complete depravity loneliness and shame. Friends, your desperate circumstances eventually erode away enough of self to bring you to your knees and surrender. These moments are when God loves to jump in with his grace and pierce your midnight with the brilliant sunshine only experienced by the forgiven and the redeemed. It's through his love, mercy, and incredible grace he is raising you and I up. He brings us life through his death where there's no greater love than this. And at some point, we can create this belief system that thinks I could achieve enough, receive enough applause and impress enough people, I would finally be comfortable being myself. And living this way, friends, will never lead you and I to being ourselves. It only leads to performers, performers who are seduced by the stage. And it's an exhausting way to live. Tony Campolo shares, there is a drivenness about American people. Each is trying to establish his or her own place in society through personal achievement. People are supposed to earn their own place on the ladder of success. But somehow, we Christians, we believe that being caught up in the drive to gain recognition and to obtain the symbols of a success is something we left behind when we committed ourselves to Christ. But few beliefs are further from the truth. The symbols, friends, of success may change, but Christians, as Christians, we are even more plagued than others by anxieties about 
our performance in life. For Christians, the stakes are even higher than for the secularist. We are constantly judging ourselves in negative ways because we fall short of expectations, right? We think our prayer life isn't good enough, that our Bible study isn't deep enough, or aren't serving or giving enough, or we're not loving enough. Applause can do things to a person. There's some things that it can do that's not healthy. Because see, what is applauded as exceptional the first time becomes expected the next time. And applause can be intoxicating, right? Applause is addictive. And like most men and women, we always want to do something great with our lives. Like most men and women, we desperately want to be somebody. Like most men and women, we focus on ourselves. C.S. Lewis brilliantly sums this up as win worship. You know, like, look at me, look at who I am. We get addicted to winning at all costs, right? And over time, we completely actually lose ourselves in the pursuit of our career. And our identity becomes so twisted and interwoven with position, prosperity, and power that the man or the woman of God that he created me to be is barely even recognizable. We can become an easy target for the narrative of the world and exchange the truth of God for a lie and destroy ourselves and our family in the process. But then God shows up and grace happens. Stunning, swift, harsh, relentless, and unbending. Our Abba Father loves us so much that he brutally spared us from destroying ourselves by removing our false dream, our idol, if you will. Let me be clear. It doesn't always feel like grace at the time. It can be brutally painful, exposing, and it can even be disappointing. That's what surrender actually looks like at times. But friends, behind the applause and the desire to being known are the questions that most of us ask ourselves in one way or another. Am I worthy? What makes me valuable? And here's the rub. We need to realize that we have been called to be known. God wants us to be known and to use that for Him. He wants us to leverage the gifts that He has given us in our calling for His glory, not for the pursuit of applause. How do you survive the applause or being known? Remember who it's from. Remember who it's for. Listen to the applause of heaven, friends, not man. Remember that you don't have to perform for the pursuit of applause. You don't have to pretend for the pursuit of applause. Your real bucket item is to be true to yourself and who God made you to be. You, friend, are a child of the living God and you are immeasurable. Step into your calling for His glory and begin to live in your belovedness today. So maybe for some of you, today is the day. Today's the day you actually need to begin that journey out of that stadium and pleasing people and beginning to open up what this life can be like in pursuit of God and who He is. See, at Northgate, we have this vision statement that actually is a real vision. We want to see more lives transformed. Well, how do we do that? Or how do we see our homes, our communities, our world transformed. Well, we do that, friends, by pursuing God. So maybe rather than pursuing self and what others expect us to be or this great athlete because my parents want me to be or this musician or running this career because I'm feeling this weight, maybe we begin to pursue exactly who God made us to be by pursuing Him. Maybe it's time to walk into building community into a new community that's with God and a oneness with God, just as Paul started discovering his true self and became so bounded in community with God, he began to discover who he truly was. Maybe today, because you've experienced the grace of God, that you can be true to yourself, that that's not a regret that you're gonna have. And because of that, friends, you get to unleash compassion. You get to share the good news of the gospel for those of us who did not deserve it. All of us who can do nothing to gain the applause of God chose to send his son 
for us as a sacrifice for you and I. It's the beauty of the gospel. So for the year with us today, and maybe you're just ready to begin that journey, there's a great next step for you. We have a journal that we want to send to you. It's called This Changes Everything. That's the title of it because when Jesus gets a hold of you in your life and you walk into that and you are found by him, it changes everything. And maybe today that's your next step. I would invite you right now just to even just take out your phone and text TCE1 to 94000. This is uh, just an opportunity where we're going to send you, we're going to mail you right now because we're not meeting in person a copy of this journal and you're not going to be able to do it alone. Um, we know that or maybe you are right now, but we want to come alongside of you. We want to have a conversation about this and support you. And for the rest of us, maybe this is just a good opportunity for you to say, hey, what applause am I working for? Am I working for the applause of people or am I working for the applause and the approval and pleasing God? How am I using the gifts that were given to me from heaven? that were uniquely given to me. And how can I continue to use those to live true to myself and to God made to be? I love you, friends. Grace, peace, and strength to you. Let's worship.